sort of a repetition repetition of the molecular orbital treatment and of chemical bonds, but let's take the example of H2. That's sort of the simplest molecule. And we have two hydrogen atoms, both with an electron configuration 1s singly occupied. And we have obviously two electrons in total. In total. Then what we do then in order to get the molecular orbitals, we do this linear combination of atomic orbitals to molecular orbitals, LCO, MO. Um, and in our case now, if I call the molecular orbitals phi, which means we make a linear combination of atomic orbitals, which I want to call chi, with some molecular orbital coefficients. That's the atomic orbitals, that's the molecular orbital coefficients, and that's our molecular orbitals. And what your hard to fog calculation actually gives you are those. That's sort of why we do a hard to fog calculation. We want to have those molecular orbital coefficients in order to need, in order to have molecular orbitals. So basically, hard to fog gives us molecular orbitals by finding those coefficients. Those are the those are sort of the eigenvectors of the diagonalized Fock matrix. Um, let's now do that with a minimal basis set. Otherwise, I now finish writing up all the determinants. Minimal basis set. And that means we have one, one S function for 1, 1, S function for each hydrogen. And how do they look like? So if I call them your hydrogen A and B, how does the 1S, not Gaussian, original 1S orbital, how does that look like? Yeah. Totally symmetric sphere. Oh, you want the function? I want the function, right? Um, yeah, and then you have the um, spherical harmonics of the zero zero. And what is that? Um, that's the. It's just a um, normalization. That's just a normalization factor, right? Uh, which, together with the normalization factor for the rest, is something like this: one over pi times the Bohr radius to the third power. Yes. And then you have the radial contribution. Yeah, and how does that look like? Um, For 1s? That's the, uh, well, um, is there a polynomial for the 1s? Mm. Is it just the exponential? Just yeah. the exponential, right. It's just the exponential e to the minus. And now comes sort of the important part for us here. Because you all might have seen those 1s functions for atoms, where they are localized at that atom. But now we have two atoms. And then normally we have the atom in the origin of the coordinate system and then just write e to the minus some, exp some exponents and then we have r and we have to divide by the total radius here. But now, we can't put both basis functions on both atoms in the origin. I mean, not both atoms can be at the same time in the origin. So one has to be somewhere else. And if you want to put the basis function on the atoms, we have to put that in here. So that is actually minus the position vector of the atom A and corresponding for B. They are located in space now, so, and where the origin is doesn't matter. So that's, and, and this of course being vectors. Um, so this one is now located at A, and correspondingly I would have one located at B. Um, now with two, this here then running from 
one to two. There's two basis functions or atomic orbitals. I get two molecular orbitals. And a uh, hard to fog calculation would give us that, uh, but we also can do it in this simple system by symmetry. So the coefficients, coefficients oops, no, are determined by symmetry. And by symmetry. Who did not have point group symmetry in some course? Two, three. Well, that's, uh, we c I think we have to talk about that some other time, but I just use it now. Um, it's sort of, you can look at what kind of operations you can perform on a molecule in order to bring it in identical positions. So in hydrogen, you can obviously turn it around because the two hydrogen nuclei, you can't distinguish them. So there are symmetry operations, uh, and then all the wave functions can be classified according to whether they, looking at the symmetry operations, which are mirror planes and axis of rotation, whether they are symmetric or anti-symmetric, whether they change the sign or not change the sign. And sort of, we have a number of symmetry operations, and you can get change the sign or not change the sign for each of the symmetry operations, so you sort of get Different, a different behavior of the wave function, and they are classified with labels, which we call irreducible representations. Um, and for the hydrogen, we get obviously we get two functions. One is called uh, a sigma g function, um, because that's sort of what kind of symmetry it has, and g means gerade, because there's a point, there's a point of inversion. And that function is symmetric with inversion. And that's just the, that is essentially just the positive combination of the two basis functions, or atomic orbitals. And we have a normalization factor, which is 2 plus 2 times s. I'll show you what the s is in a second. And we get a second molecular orbital, which is now anti-symmetric, because it has a minus sign here. And also the normalization factor has a minus sign. And the S, that is just the overlap integral between the two basis functions. Like this. Now, oh, I didn't want to write that there. How do they look like, those molecular orbitals? Yes, yes, you can draw it, you sort of can draw a density. Um, if you imagine you're moving along the internuclear axis and you look at the value of the wave function or the square of the wave function, where here you would have A and B, then they sort of would look like like this, sort of. <coughs> that could be either the density or just the, wave func the value of the wave function, whereas the other one would then look like, like. Now if I take the, oops, no, if I take the square of the wave function, then it would like, look like this, sort of. Where here it goes to zero, and there it does not. So you have the bonding and you have the, the anti-bonding. Uh, but we often use another representation also, where we basically draw the atomic orbitals, and then by different color or in some other way, mark the sign in the linear combination of the ones. So you could, so if that's A and B again, I could draw sort of a sphere, that's a sphere, although you might not see it. That's the 1s orbital here, and then, put that a bit closer, and then I have another 1s there, and here they have the same sign, so that's the bonding, or I could sort of make a very simple equivalent picture for the anti-bonding, where 
with some color or another way ident identify that this has a different sign. That's actually, I mean, that, that's not how the molecular orbital looks like. That's just writing basically this up here. If you, if you would like to, to get an idea more, if you really would plot like you plot the atomic orbitals, you make a contour surface and, and you require that there are a certain amount of the electron densities within that contour. If you would do that for a molecular orbital, then it definitely would look, it would look different. It would maybe look something like, like this for the bonding orbital. Um, and in a way similar to that one for the antibonding. Maybe a bit sort of the density a bit more sort of a bit more away from it. And again, a different sign here. But the bonding orbital looks, look, looks different. Um, and then, of course, we can make those orbital energy diagrams. Because from a hard to fog calculation, we get, in addition to the molecular orbital coefficients, which are the eigenvectors from diagonalizing the fog matrix, we get also the eigenvalues which are the orbital energies. Um, and then we obviously get something that we get a lower orbital energy for the sigma gerade and a higher one for the sigma ungerade. Um, 